Think working out has to be hard? Well, think again. HIIT workouts appear to do the impossible by helping you burn more calories than a 40-minute run in a quarter of the time. Better yet, they also build muscle, improve athletic performance and give you more energy. They've been transforming the lives of people all around the world and if you want to achieve one of those cover model physiques, then this is probably just what you're looking for. Ready to get started with the most highly effective and efficient workouts on the planet? Then let's get started. Along the way, we'll discover that there's a lot more to HIIT than just the basic alternating speeds. We'll learn some advanced techniques like cardio acceleration, fartlek training, speed drills, concurrent training, metacon, tabata, finishers and more. Let's HIIT it. If you want to build muscle, you need to cause muscle damage and metabolic stress. By lifting weights, you can cause a build-up of damage and this will provide precisely the stimulation you need to trigger muscle growth during rest. To lose fat, improve your fitness and get better health though, you need to use cardiovascular training. Cardiovascular training is any type of training that involves exerting yourself for an extended period of time. Very often this will mean running long distances, with jogging perhaps being the most popular form of cardio training. Not far behind though are swimming, cycling, skipping, rowing and others. Traditionally, this kind of cardiovascular training has been steady state. That means you put on your running shoes, you step out the door and you run for about 40 to 60 minutes. It's steady state because you're maintaining a steady level of exertion throughout the course of the exercise. In this case, you're jogging at a set pace and then maintaining that pace. For a long time, this was thought to be the very best way to burn the maximum number of calories and to improve fitness. There was a good theory behind why this should be the case. Specifically, it was thought that there was an optimal fat burning zone and that this could be found at roughly 70% of your maximum heart rate. This makes sense in theory, seeing as faster than 70% of your MHR will put you past your anaerobic threshold. In other words, you will be running so fast that you wouldn't be able to rely on your aerobic energy system for fuel. You simply couldn't burn fat quickly enough and so you will be forced to rely on energy stored in your muscles as ATP and glycogen. It would appear to make sense then that running at 70% of your MHR and maintaining the maximum pace at which the body burns fat should result in the maximum weight loss. But this isn't what modern research has found. HIIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training and it completely turns this concept on its head. In HIIT, you actually alternate between bursts of intense exertion, such as sprinting, and periods of relatively low intensity exercise, like jogging or power walking. This way, you are switching from your anaerobic energy system to your aerobic system and back. Switching between burning energy stored in your blood and muscles and energy stored as fat. But what makes this so effective is what happens after the anaerobic training. When you exert yourself maximally by sprinting or exercising otherwise at 100%, you can deplete any energy that might have been available from sources other than fat. This means your body can only burn fat for energy, you know, there's no other option remaining. Thus, you will then burn even more fat during the aerobic portions of the exercise. And when you finish and go home, you will continue to burn fat stores because you'll be low on store glycogen. This is what some people refer to as the afterburn effect, and it means that after an intensive session of HIIT, you can continue to burn more calories for the entire remainder of the day. As we saw in the last video, HIIT is able to burn more calories than steady state cardio. And because you're exerting yourself more at certain points throughout your training, 
you should also finish in a much shorter space of time. Typically, an HIIT session can last between 10 to 20 minutes and be just as effective in terms of calories burned as a 40-minute run. For those who have a busy and hectic work schedule then, HIIT training is the ideal solution and allows them to squeeze in a few short minutes of highly effective training to get amazing results. There are more reasons to get excited about HIIT too. When looking at any type of training program, what's always useful to keep in mind is the SAID principle. This means specific adaptations to impose demands. It means that your body changes to adapt the demands placed on it. If you train at altitude, you become better at training at altitude. If you jog, you become better at jogging. Thus, HIIT makes you better at high intensity activities, which include sprinting, running, rowing, boxing, wrestling, play fighting, sports, moving furniture and more. These are the things that we are much more likely to utilise in our daily lives and that makes this a more adaptive and more useful form of training. Whereas steady state cardio makes you more effective at long slogs, HIIT makes you explosive and athletic. This also creates a number of other great advantages too. For instance, HIIT has been shown to help improve the efficiency and number of mitochondria. Mitochondria are tiny energy factories that live inside all our cells and have the critical role of creating and utilising ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. This is the most fundamental form of energy in the human body and it's what fuels all our movements as well as our thoughts. More mitochondria means greater energy efficiency. That means yet more athletic performance and even more brain power. Your brain cells have mitochondria too. Ever wondered why little kids seem to run in circles all day without getting tired while older generations get exhausted from getting up to turn on the TV? One of the big reasons for this discrepancy is the difference in the number and efficiency of mitochondria. This also improves your VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen you're capable of using. The greater your VO2 max, the more efficient you become at oxygenating your body. This is one of the biggest indicators of physical fitness and one of the things that athletes are encouraged to focus on in their training. But perhaps the best of all is that the kind of explosive movement used in HIIT will invariably engage your fast twitch muscle fibre. These are the muscle fibres that contain more mitochondria and that are responsible for delivering rapid power. They're also the biggest type of muscle fibres and the ones that will make you look like a bodybuilder. If you engage in steady state cardio, then you can risk converting your fast twitch muscle fibre into slow twitch fibre. Why? Because you're placing high energy demands on your body over a long duration and thus your body will want to move the ratio towards the most efficient form of muscle fibre. What's more is that you create a highly catabolic environment that, in short, starves your body of fuel and forces it to break down both fat and muscle. This is why most long distance runners also happen to be stick thin. But when you engage your fast twitch muscle fibres, you show your body that you need explosiveness and you shorten the length of the catabolic period. This in turn means that you don't risk breaking down muscle tissue in the same way, allowing you to create a physique that is hard, ripped and powerful. Women can expect tone definition, while men can expect rippling vascularity and striations. That's why, as we stated earlier, this is the preferred weight loss strategy of cover models and celebrities. So let's recap. This is a form of training that is quicker than conventional steady state cardio, able to burn a much greater number of calories in a shorter time, able to create an afterburn effect for increased metabolism throughout the day, Effective in increasing energy levels, effective in protecting muscle against deterioration for a leaner, harder physique, and excellent for your all-round health.
Oh, and did we mention that it's also highly versatile and practical and can be performed anywhere? Yep, that's pretty much why people love HIIT. Let's introduce it into your routine, shall we? Just before we do that, though, let's take a closer look at the science. Yep, boring, I know, but it will be crucial in helping you to really understand what you're doing rather than just following a routine blindly. And we'll do that in the next video. Let's first consider how the body gets energy and manages that energy during exertion. First, in order to exercise, the body needs energy. This energy comes from a source known as ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, which is described in scientific circles as the energy currency of life. This substance is a nucleotide made up of three phosphogen molecules bonded together by a powerful force. That's what the name literally means, tri meaning three, phosphate meaning phosphogen. All types of energy in the body are ultimately converted into ATP, so when you eat a big cake, the sugar and glucose will ultimately need to be converted into this molecule before it can be of any use to your muscles or your cells. In real terms, any one mole of ATP energy will provide 7.3 calories. It would take just over 190 micromoles to move your index finger enough to click a mouse button on a computer, and this would equate to around 1.42 calories. The power in this substance, however, doesn't come from the phosphogen itself, but from the powerful bonds that bind it together. And it's when these bonds break that they unleash the energy that the body can utilize. An athlete needs to be able to supply their muscles with a lot of ATP then in order to perform the necessary movements for running or weightlifting. And there are three ways in which they can do this. The first way the body gets ATP is through the phosphogen system. This is also known as the ATP-CP system, which uses the ATP stored in muscles to supply that energy. The body can store enough ATP at any one time to allow for around three seconds of full-powered exertion, a little more or a little less, depending on your physical fitness and various other factors, at which point it will need to look elsewhere. Fortunately, Breaking the ATP molecules results in some useful byproducts. ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, with two and one bonded phosphogen molecules, respectively. So if you imagine you have three bonded molecules and they break, you will understandably be left with a one and a two, or three single molecules. You know, it's basic math. The good news is that using a substance called creatine phosphate, hence the CP, can then recombine these molecules to make them back into ATP, ready to be broken once more for extra energy. The body can store enough creatine for roughly 8 to 10 seconds of continued exertion, meaning that in total the body can use the phosphogen system for around 13 seconds maximum of continued exertion. That is enough to sprint just over 100 metres. It is thought, however, that through the use of creatine supplements, this maximum time can be increased marginally. At this point, if exertion continues, the body needs to get its ATP from somewhere else, and this is when it looks into its stored carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. This represents the shift to what is known as the glycogen lactic acid system. This system is a slightly slower and less efficient means of supplying energy, which requires the body to split the glycogen first into glucose and then again into ATP. This unfortunately creates a number of unwanted byproducts called metabolites, including lactic acid, from which the substance takes its name. This metabolic buildup creates the uncomfortable, mildly painful burning sensation we get in our muscles when we push ourselves in the gym. 
The body can sustain itself using the glycogen lactic acid system for a further 1 minute and 30 seconds until this build-up becomes too much to tolerate. If we continue to try and push ourselves at MHR past this point, it can lead to nausea and even fainting. It was long believed that lactic acid was actually responsible for this failure and for the burning sensation. However, more recent research has shown us that lactate is not harmful in itself, but rather seems to correlate with other factors that fatigue the glycogen lactic acid system. Thus, high-level athletes can still monitor their buildup of lactate in the blood in order to calculate a lactate inflection point. With training, it's possible to improve tolerance to metabolites and thus sustain maximum exertion for longer. And guess what you can use to improve this aspect of your fitness? You guessed it, HIIT. Both these systems are anaerobic, meaning that for the first 1 minute and 43 seconds, the body won't be using oxygen or burning fat. In order to lose weight, the training must continue past this point and force the body to find its energy elsewhere. This is where the aerobic system comes in, relying on the oxidization of foodstuffs in our mitochondria. In other words, the body looks to our supplies of glycogen, and so ATP, stored in our cells as fat and then uses the oxygen in our blood to break them down and carry them to our muscles. This leads to fat being burned directly. It forces us to breathe more heavily in order to supply the necessary amount of oxygen and it increases our heart rate further to transport the oxygen to the fat stores and then to bring the energy to our muscles and brain. The aerobic energy system can actually be used indefinitely and will continue until you completely exhaust all supplies of energy located around the body. During a typical prolonged endurance test, you will find you also break down protein for energy and even muscle. This is in contrast to high-intensity exercises that will use 100% carbohydrates for fuel purely because they provide the quickest and most accessible source of ATP. So, if you head outside and start jogging, you'll notice that, at first, you don't need to gasp for breath in order to maintain your speed, and your heart rate doesn't immediately go crazy. That's because you're using your ATP-CP system. If you continue with this exertion, though, you'll switch to your glycogen lactic acid system. This will use up energy stored as glycogen in the muscles. This will lead to an increase in lactate and metabolites in the muscles and the bloodstream, leading to nausea, muscle pain, cramping and more. It's at this point that things become uncomfortable. If you're running fast, you will continue to use this system until you eventually pass out, and this is our lactate threshold, or your lactate inflection point. This is the point at which the build-up of lactate and metabolites becomes too great for you to maintain that level of exercise. This will happen before you have completely exhausted the stored glycogen in the muscles. But most of us will instead find we are forced to slow down before we reach our inflection point and switch to the aerobic system. We will drop to sub-maximal exertion triggered by the physical symptoms and will find a steady pace at around 70% of our maximum heart rate. This will mean we have time to burn fat for fuel, which will require heavy breathing and a high heart rate, but which won't lead to the same levels of discomfort. If you are training with steady-state cardio, you will continue this level of exertion indefinitely and stop after you've burned a satisfactory number of calories. Following this, your body would then continue to use a combination of all three systems for tasks throughout the remainder of the day. Low blood sugar, however, would trigger a release of the hunger hormone ghrelin, and this will be accompanied by cortisol, the stress hormone. This is why we're always stressed when we're hungry. This would also correlate with an increase in myostatin, an unpopular molecule that leads to an increased breakdown of muscle. This is on top of the increased protein breakdown during the exercise itself. But if you utilize HIIT, 
you will use the aerobic system for a set period of time, giving your body enough time to clear the lactate buildup in your bloodstream, and then you will switch back to the maximum exertion to further deplete the glucose stores. This would mean you were taking a small break from burning fat and blood sugar, thus reducing the negative impact on your mood and muscle mass. Moreover, it would mean you could almost entirely empty your glycogen stores and thereby force your body to use blood sugar and fat stores for even the simplest movements for a long period afterwards while it creates more glycogen. With all that we covered in the last video, you now know the science, so it's time to start putting that theory into practice. The great news is that HIIT training really is just as easy as it sounds, and simply involves alternating between periods of high exertion and relatively low intensity exercise. There are a few caveats, however, and it's important to approach this in a sensible and structured way in order to avoid injury or disappointment. Most people will begin their HIIT with running, as this is a very straightforward form of cardio training that doesn't require access to any specialist tools and that anyone can understand and use. There are countless HIIT protocols, however, and these vary in length and intensity. The key thing to recognize here is that high-intensity training of any kind can be highly dangerous if you have never done it before, if you're overweight, or if you're in very poor physical health. It's also dangerous if you have any pre-existing heart conditions. In short, you need a basic heart strength before you start pushing it to 100%. Thus, it's a good idea to build up at least a basic level of fitness before you start your HIIT training. If you're still gasping for breath whenever you ascend the stairs, then you're not ready for HIIT. But here's the thing. Even if you're used to exercising regularly and you're in good shape, switching to HIIT will still come as a very big shock if you've not used it before. This is a whole new ball game in terms of the demands it places on your body and you'll be surprised at how quickly you end up in a gasping heap on the floor. If you've never exercised before, then pay attention to the next section. If you've not used HIIT before but you're in generally good shape, then you can fast forward to the one after that. Just a note of caution here, before beginning an intensive training routine, it is always a good idea to consult with your doctor and to ensure that you don't have any underlying heart conditions. Before you start pushing yourself to your cardiovascular limit, it's a good idea to first build up a basic level of fitness that will prevent you from shocking your heart too much. Right now you might be thinking that you don't need to worry about this and it's not likely you're going to suffer heart problems. Even if you're not worried though, Building this basic level of fitness is important for your ability to stick with an intense HIIT workout. And this is the mistake too many people make. They launch straight into their training and hope they'll be able to keep up a pace that's far above what they find comfortable. The belief is that you need to be pushing beyond your comfort levels in order to lose weight. But what actually happens is you end up hating exercise and dreading your workouts. The result is that you find yourself putting it off and unable to take part unless you're feeling your very best. In no time at all, your training falls by the wayside and you give up. So don't aim to start losing weight or transform your fitness right away. Rather, focus on gradually improving your fitness so that your workouts are never outside the realms of comfortable to begin with. You'll find that as you do this, you learn to do more and eventually this allows you to take on more challenging workouts and actually stick with them. So, how do you build up this basic fitness? Well, the answer is actually to start with steady-state cardio using a gentle pace to begin with and then build up. Begin with running, but don't aim to run a long distance or to run quickly to begin with. Instead, just aim to enjoy running. Set out with comfortable running shoes and jog carefully and slowly for half an hour. 
When it becomes painful, go home. Do this once a week, and over time you'll find that you start running faster and further without even trying. Importantly, though, you won't risk exhausting your body, you won't damage your knees over training, or you won't learn to loathe your training. This can be very frustrating at first if you are hoping to get into great shape right away. But what's very important here is to be disciplined with yourself. You know, a lot of people think that getting into great shape is all about being disciplined enough to keep training. Just as important, though, is to be disciplined enough to be patient and to build that basic level of strength before you approach the more intense types of training. Build up your strength and stamina slowly, and then you can look at adding HIIT workouts. And again, you're going to start gently. A lot of people will hear the words HIIT and assume this is one type of workout. In reality, though, HIIT is a very broad and flexible term that can encompass a great many different types of training and a great many different protocols. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to start HIIT and dive in right at the deep end with an intensive program aimed at the incredibly fit. One of the most popular choices, for instance, is Tabata. This is a brutal, punishing, fast and highly effective method of training that will leave you gasping for air and covered in sweat in just four minutes. But it's also far too intense to start with, and especially when running. So instead, let's begin with a very easy beginner routine. Jog for two minutes and sprint for 10 seconds. Repeat this five times. It sounds very easy, but you'll quickly find that just 10 seconds of sprinting is more than enough to completely exhaust you. By the time you're finished, you'll be completely exhausted and you'll feel as though you can't perform another two minute jogging session. Finish this with a 10 minute cool down. The entire workout will take you 12 minutes but you'll find you're easily as tired, if not more tired, than you would have been after jogging at a steady state for 30 to 40 minutes. Moreover, this is enough to trigger the afterburn effect and to leave you burning calories for hours afterwards. Because this type of training is so fast, you can afford to do this two or three times a week. Once you start to become more confident, you can then move on to the next step which is jog for two minutes, then sprint for 30 seconds. You can also increase the number of laps to eight and then 10. Eventually, you might be able to work all the way up to jog for one minute, then sprint for 30 seconds, or jog for one minute, then sprint for one minute. Again, though, you should only move on to these harder difficulty levels once you've built up the basic fitness and heart strength to be able to cope relatively easily. You should be exhausted at the end, but not at the point where you can't do anything for the rest of the day or where you're unable to train again for days and days on end. When performing the sprints, Remember that it doesn't actually matter how fast you're going as long as you're maxing out your potential. In other words, there's a good chance that you're going to find yourself slowing down somewhere as you reach the later stages of your routine, and you shouldn't worry if that happens. Wearing a fitness tracker or a running watch can help you with this. Something like the Garmin Vivo Active will provide the best of both worlds here by acting as a fitness tracker throughout the day, measuring your heart rate and your steps, etc. But acting as a running watch during training and letting you monitor your route and your metrics. Your maximum heart rate is something you can calculate quite easily. Simply go for a sprint or engage in other activity with maximum effort. Monitor your heart rate and you should find that it never goes beyond a certain point. This point is your max heart rate and it's what you should be aiming to hit whenever you perform the high intensity portions of these workouts. The speed is less important. 
And of course, you can also use this to work out 70% of your MHR, which should be your fat burning zone. While HIIT itself is fairly simple to grasp, there are actually a lot of different factors to consider. For example, you need to decide whether to use exercise machines or to avoid them and train outside instead. If you're going to use HIIT for running, for instance, should you use a treadmill or should you head outside and jog and sprint? Well, the answer is that it's up to you, of course, and both have their advantages. What's key to recognise is the different benefits of each and thereby be able to make the best decision for you. Now, a lot of people will look down on exercise machines. There are a number of problems with these. For starters, they prevent you from getting outside, which in itself has a huge number of different health benefits. At the same time, though, you'll also find that running outside has the advantage of training your legs harder and actually uses significantly different biomechanics. That's because running on a pavement or grass will require pulling force generated in your legs as you have to pull your body along the ground. Conversely, when you run on a treadmill, you only need to lift your legs off the ground as the treadmill moves underneath you. As such, there is actually less effort involved in running on a treadmill. Running outside is also a lot more varied. While it's possible to alter the angle and the pace on a treadmill, it's still going to involve selecting from one of a number of different positions and sticking with it. When you run outside, meanwhile, you're forced to constantly adapt to changes in the shape of the ground, to the gradient that you're running on, and more. Of course, many of these issues are less significant if you're riding a stationary bike, but the variety and the real-world value of running is one of the things that attracts a lot of people to it in the first place. But this doesn't mean there's no place at all for running on a treadmill. First of all, running on a treadmill is a good option if you have a bad knee or another complaint. Running at a fixed incline is a good way to reduce the strain on the knees and many people will thus prefer to stick to a treadmill so that they can control this facet. Better yet for bad knees or back complaints is to ride a stationary recumbent bike. Bikes have zero impact which makes them better for those with joint complaints. A recumbent bike, meanwhile, is a type of bike that has you leaning backwards with your legs outstretched in front of you. This in turn means that you aren't placing any weight on your legs or your spine and can simply concentrate on driving the pedals. CV machines are also great for training when you can't be bothered to head outside because it's raining or cold. And if you're someone who will struggle to be motivated in this regard, then you should consider that a very big bonus. It's always better to perform an easier form of exercise and stick with it than it is to perform a more challenging form, but then give up after the first week. Lastly, running on machines will give you the ability to precisely control the level of challenge. This means you can monitor the exact speed you're able to maintain and get a very good estimate of your calorie burn. Some will even include heart rate monitors or synchronise with external gadgets to perform this job. All this is ideal for HIIT because it means you can run for exactly one minute at a very precise speed and then switch. Next week, you can do the exact same thing, and once you're used to that, you can increase the challenge by a very small and precise amount. Before we get into the different tools and strategies you can use to mix up your HIIT training, a note that there is a way you can increase your calorie burn significantly simply by changing the time of day that you train. This technique is called fasted cardio, and it involves training first thing in the morning before breakfast. It's called fasted cardio because your body is in a fasted state. While you haven't been consciously starving yourself, you will not have eaten for a while merely as a result of having been asleep for so long. This means your body will be very low on energy reserves as your glycogen stores and blood sugar are all but depleted. 
you'll have higher levels of cortisol as a result, which is why many of us are cranky in the morning. And it's even one of the things that actually wakes us up. Cortisol is one of our wakefulness neurotransmitters, and it works in direct opposition to melatonin. If you train at this point, in other words, before breakfast, you'll be training at a massive calorie deficit and you'll be forced to burn more fat. Unfortunately, this also means you're more likely to burn muscle. This is mitigated to some extent by performing HIIT rather than steady-state cardio, and especially if you're using concurrent training. More about that later. But it's worth bearing in mind if your goal is to build lean muscle. If your goal is simply weight loss, though, then go for it. Just make sure to give yourself a few minutes after getting up so that your spine is less vulnerable to injury. As you begin using HIIT to build basic levels of fitness and progress to improve your metabolism and performance, you can branch out to try more varied and challenging protocols. What's more... Many of these types of training can help to provide very specific benefits and help you to reach particular goals. If you know precisely what you're trying to achieve with your training, then you might find that one of these types of training is actually the most advantageous to you. In this video, we're going to be looking at adding an additional layer of resistance into our training. In the next two videos, we'll learn how to mix up the timing in order to alter the challenge. One of the best ways to mix up your training is to change the type of exercise you're using in your HIIT routines. This is something we'll discuss a lot more in later videos, but the first thing to consider is combining cardio and resistance training together in the form of resistance cardio also called concurrent training. Concurrent training is essentially a type of cardio where your movements are challenged by some form of resistance. In short, it's like weightlifting combined with cardio. An obvious example is to increase the resistance setting on a stationary bike or to run on sand. But actually, there are much better examples. One is to perform pull-ups quickly, or to perform press-ups, or push-ups as they're also called, quickly. You can also try punching a heavy bag, which requires muscle power in the shoulders in particular. Or you can try running while pushing or pulling something heavy behind or in front of you. This has a huge number of advantages. The principal one being that it's even more protective against muscle deterioration. That is to say you can perform this kind of cardio and burn a lot of calories without worrying that you'll lose much muscle. This is because you're engaging even more of your fast twitch muscle fibers and you're driving blood and metabolites to your muscles where they'll stimulate growth. At the same time, the increase in growth hormone and testosterone, triggered by the breakdown of muscle, will mean an improved level of fat burning and muscle building. Anabolic hormones such as these don't only encourage the body to build muscle, but also to burn fat, which is why steroid users look so incredibly lean, as well as being incredibly strong. Of course, steroids also have a ton of very serious side effects, so this is a way that we can get the same kind of anabolic results without the dangers associated with them. Building muscle at the same time as burning fat will help you to create a much superior physique too, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize. If you're unhappy with your current physique right now and you want to look more attractive in and out of your clothes, then simply losing weight will make you either look very skinny or potentially even flabby if you have lots of loose skin left over. Want to get rid of cellulite? Well, losing weight won't do it. The only way to get rid of it is to tone up your legs, buttocks or whatever the offending area may be. Want to get a flat stomach? Far from burning fat, the best way to do this is actually to strengthen the transverse abdominis. This is the muscle that wraps around your midsection and is responsible for keeping your organs and your gut pulled in. 
the best example of all, the kettlebell swing. When you look up HIIT protocols, you'll find that it's very common to see them recommend kettlebell swings. That's because the kettlebell swing is in many ways the ideal choice for HIIT, especially if you're interested in building muscle as well as burning fat. And if you ever visit a CrossFit gym, you'll always find that both the kettlebell swing and HIIT are among the favourite tools they use during their workouts. To perform a kettlebell swing, you of course need a kettlebell. Now this is an iron ball with a handle on the top. You can lift the ball using the handle and treat it like a dumbbell. Unlike a dumbbell, though, a kettlebell has the weight located at the bottom and this moves the centre of gravity. Now, as you lift the handle, the position of the weight will change, altering the angle of the resistance. You'll also be able to swing the kettlebell in a variety of ways, which causes that weight to move away and then towards you, respectively. This now adds an additional challenge, which is coping with the momentum of the kettlebell and avoiding letting it pull or push you off balance. As a result, the kettlebell uses a lot of smaller supporting muscles that are overlooked in other types of training, and this helps you to develop functional strength. The swinging motion also means you can use various different forms of continuous motion, which is ideal for all kinds of CV challenges. This is exactly our objective when using the kettlebell swing, where we will be swinging the weight between our legs up and down in a pendulum motion. Simply grab the kettlebell in both hands and choose a weight that's going to become challenging after 20 seconds. You should be standing straight with your legs shoulder width apart and the kettlebell hanging in front of you, held in both hands with arms straight. Squat down slightly and as you do, allow the kettlebell to swing in between your legs. Now, push through your legs and stand back up and as you do, thrust your hips forward to push the weight out in front of you. Keep your arms straight and don't attempt to lift the weight but instead let it swing up naturally in front of you. For a traditional kettlebell swing, it should reach about the height of your shoulders. The American swing reaches above your head. For a second, the kettlebell will hang in the air and then it will start to descend again as gravity starts to do its thing. Follow the trajectory downward and as you do so, Drop back into the squat position and let the weight swing back through your legs again. That's one repetition. Unlike other weighted exercises like curls or bench presses, the kettlebell swing is perfect for cardio exercises because you can keep going and allow gravity to do its thing as you start tiring. Because you're involving your muscles though, you'll find it burns more calories simply because it's harder than running normally, and you'll protect your muscles from deterioration. The specific muscles used in the kettlebell swing are all those that make up the posterior chain. These are the muscles in the back and legs that you use for jumping and sprinting, and thus this is an excellent way to improve your overall athletic performance. What's more, many of these are the muscles we consider most attractive. For women looking to improve their legs, bums and tums, the kettlebell swing is one of the very best choices. In fact, there is something of an internet meme going around at the moment called women who squat. It's become common knowledge that squatting gives women a great behind. The kettlebell swing works all the same muscles, but also burns fat, making it the perfect sculpting tool. Men who use the exercise, meanwhile, will benefit from the core involvement and the weight loss that makes it ideal for creating toned abs. The best bit? The kettlebell is simple, cheap and easy to use. Instead of heading outside in the rain to perform your HIIT workouts, you can use this right at home over the course of 20 minutes. In this video and the next one, we're going to cover some more advanced HIIT protocols. 
As I mentioned earlier, you'll want to build up to a good level of basic fitness before you attempt any of these. Once you have though, you'll find you're quickly able to take your fitness to the next level. We have already mentioned Tabata, which is one of the best known examples of HIIT and one of the most efficient and brutally effective options for burning lots of fat and at the same time toning and building muscle. The best thing about Tabata? It takes only four minutes to get an incredibly intense workout. And that's because the split is incredibly short, consisting of 20 seconds of high intensity and 10 seconds of rest. You then repeat the process for a total of eight times. 20 seconds might not sound like a long period of high intensity, but when you only have 10 seconds of rest between each burst, you'll find it becomes incredibly taxing and your body will be begging you to stop towards the end. This is ideal because it will train your ability to recover and to remove the lactate and metabolites from your system so that you're ready to return to your first two energy systems to provide fuel. You can use Tabata for running, but actually it's arguably more popular when combined with other exercises such as those resistance cardio methods we discussed in the last video. Grab a 30 kilogram kettlebell and perform Tabata using that, and you'll be completely exhausted by the end and should be able to feel your heart racing in your chest. Another good option is to use some form of jumping exercise, such as jack-in-the-boxes or tuck jumps. You can even vary it up by creating a circuit that allows you to go from one exercise to another. We'll look at this more in subsequent videos. Note that if you find Tabata too punishing to begin with, you can perform fewer repetitions. Four circuits of Tabata is more than hard enough, but it doesn't have the unwanted side effect of making your heart burst out through your ribcage. Tabata is a strange way of training because it will tax you incredibly in a short space of time, but it isn't particularly effective on its own for weight loss or body transformations due to its brevity. A solution is to use Tabata as what is known as a finisher. A finisher is a type of workout you do at the end of another workout. So if you have completed a weightlifting session or perhaps a session of regular steady state cardio, you can incorporate Tabata at the end to finish off and thereby maximize your calorie burn for the rest of the day while depleting any and all remaining glycogen stores. Note as well that Tabata is unique from the HIIT workouts we've looked at so far inasmuch as it has a real rest period rather than a period of lighter activity. You can swap this for active recovery if you prefer and do that by holding plank for example or by jogging very lightly on the spot. A side note that applies to Tabata in particular but also to all these HIIT workouts to a degree is just how powerful this is for training your mental discipline. When you're absolutely exhausted, pushing yourself to the absolute limit again can be incredibly hard. This requires a lot of mental discipline and self-control, and that is actually one of the things that is most exciting and beneficial about HIIT in general. If you can complete a punishing round of Tabata, well, you can complete anything. Finding Tabata too easy? Want more of a challenge? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Okay, as it happens though, if you're that sadistic, I do happen to have something even worse up my sleeve. And this is also a great choice if you're someone who is interested in building muscle and creating a really ripped physique. Say hello to cardio acceleration. Essentially, Cardio acceleration is a perversion of HIIT and resistance training that combines a full gym workout with a cardio workout. Normally, if you're working out in the gym in order to build muscle, you will do so by performing exercises as reps and sets. 
You perform a set of 6, 8, 10 or 12 exercises and then you rest for a minute before going again. What you're doing in this case is building up metabolites in the muscle that stimulate growth and you're creating micro tears. The heavy weight means you're using your fastest twitch muscle fibre, which means you'll be relying on glycogen and ATP stored in the muscle. So you need to pause after performing those 10 reps in order to build up the strength to go again for the next round. The most common protocol for the gym is to perform three sets of 10 reps on each exercise. Cardio acceleration turns this into a monstrosity of a challenge though by removing the minute rest in between each exercise. You're still going to give the muscle a rest but you're no longer going to give your body a rest because you're going to perform some kind of cardio exercises such as tuck jumps, high knees, sprinting, step machine, skipping, etc. And you're going to do this with high intensity. What you also do is to target the muscles that you aren't using. So if you just performed bench press, then you won't use boxing as your cardio to pair it with because that will train the pecs and shoulders again. Likewise, if you just did squats, you're not going to train with kettlebell swings or tuck jumps. Cardio acceleration works absolute wonders for your body because it allows you to get all the benefits of a weightlifting workout and all the benefits of a cardio workout rolled into one. That means you'll build muscle while at the same time burning fat. What's more, you'll be able to keep your heart rate high for your entire weightlifting routine. This means that you'll burn an incredible number of calories and specifically several hundred percent more. Because you're training the upper body and the lower body intermittently, this also has the advantage of directing blood from the top to the bottom. In other words, you'll need plenty of oxygen and nutrients in your biceps for those curls and then you'll need them in your legs for that sprinting. Thus, your heart is working even harder to send the blood up and down and up and down and you'll burn even more calories. The hormonal response to this kind of training is also massive. There are downsides too though, of course. The first is that cardio acceleration is absolutely horrendous to go through. This is a serious challenge and should only be attempted once you're very fit and very strong already. It's also something you probably won't want to do very regularly. The other downside is that you won't build as much muscle as you would do from a regular weightlifting workout. That's because you'll be depleting your strength and thus won't be able to perform your lifts with as much weight or as good a technique. If your aim is to become a massive bodybuilder type, then you should stay away from cardio acceleration. However, if your aim is to become a lean machine who would look incredible on the cover of a fitness magazine, then you should think about it. Just be ready for a real challenge. There are a couple of other advanced HIIT protocols that you might also want to try, and I'll talk about those in the next video. In the last video, we talked about a couple of advanced HIIT protocols which can really take your training to another level. In this video, I want to detail two more. The first one is fartlek. Fartlek may be just the most ridiculous sounding name for a workout, but it's actually a very useful tool, so let's not judge this particular rose by its name. In fact, fartlek actually translates directly as time play. It is so called cool because you're going to be dividing your regular cardio workouts in a manner of ways to suit your particular training goals. This way, you can combine steady state cardio with interval training and build towards a variety of different objectives at once. To explain it simply, Fartlek merely means that you can choose between how you want to divide your time between sprinting, jogging, walking and everything else in between. 
And it doesn't just have to be time that is the deciding factor here either. You can just as easily train so you switch speeds depending on the distance or so that you watch your heart rate. For example, a great way to improve your recovery times is to sprint for one minute and then jog gradually until your heart rate reaches 70% of your MHR again. When that happens, you increase your speed once more and then go slow until it's back at 70%. Another interesting challenge is to introduce more outside factors to make things more exciting and less predictable. For instance, keep an eye on the street lamps that you're passing. Each time you go past one, change your speed until the next one. You might sprint, jog, walk, sprint, jog, walk, or find another way to switch things up. The same thing can be achieved with a skipping rope or a kettlebell. Alternatively, you can try to jog for a distance and then sprint at the end to burn off the remaining calories and improve your lactate threshold, etc. Finally, one that I find particularly enjoyable is something I call anabolic running. Here, you simply sprint for 100 metres, walk back and then sprint the distance again. This also has the advantage of letting you perform a very intensive cardio workout without needing to travel a long distance because you don't always have the luxury of being near a beautiful scenic park and sometimes you need to stay close to home. Finally, there's Metcon. Metcon is a portmanteau for the words metabolic and conditioning. As this might suggest, Metcon is a form of workout designed specifically with the goal of helping you to strengthen your metabolism in order to improve your energy efficiency, resting metabolic rate and generally your ability to turn food into usable energy. The aforementioned fartlek example that challenges you to start running again each time your heart rate reaches 70% can also be considered an example of Metcon, as this is improving your ability to clear your blood of metabolites and lactate, as well as your ability to recover quickly back to a steady resting heart rate. This is a good example of Metcon, as well as a form of zone training. If you get the right fitness tracker, then this can actually be used to alert you once your heart rate reaches specific zones, saving you from constantly having to check your wrist every minute or so. More often though, the term Metcon is used to describe short, focused bursts of high-intensity activity with a minimum amount of rest in between. A good example is the ladder workout, which involves performing 10 good reps of a given exercise, such as pull-ups or clapping exercises, resting for 30 seconds, and then performing 9 reps. You keep going until you reach one repetition, at which point the challenge has ended. The circuit routines we'll look at in the next video can also be considered examples of Metcons. If you look for a workout on YouTube, then you'll find there's no shortage of content available to help out. In particular, you'll find a lot of videos from the likes of Mike Chang, Jeff Cavalier and other YouTube celebrities that promise you can get great results in 20 minutes by following along. Invariably, these workouts will essentially boil down to circuit routines. They will set up a few stations in a small space and then they will train on each one for a set amount of time before moving to the next. Circuit training is a very simple way of working out that has been around forever, but it's also something that has come back into vogue in a big way since HIIT became so popular. That's partly due to their similarities and with a renewed understanding of what makes HIIT so effective, we're keen to apply these same ideas to other types of workout. Circuit training like this can be designed to work as a form of Metcon while also offering resistance cardio, concurrent training, and being very easy to perform in a small amount of space and a short amount of time. But just because circuit training has the potential to be highly effective, that doesn't mean that it always is. 
In fact, circuit training can very often be a waste of time, especially if you watch the wrong channel. Not all of six-pack shortcuts workouts are that well thought out, for example. There is an art to designing the perfect circuit, and getting this right will depend partly on your goals. The first thing to consider before you begin your circuit plan is exactly what it is you hope to achieve through it. As you're watching a video on HIIT, Chances are that you want to burn calories and lose fat in a short amount of time and essentially turn this into a form of HIIT or METCON. The problem is, a lot of circuits just don't offer enough of a challenge to your cardiovascular system for you to accomplish this. If your workout is made up of sit-ups, stretches and pulling against towels, which is a waste of time in case you've discovered these workouts on YouTube, you won't be depleting your glucose or increasing your heart rate sufficiently to see results. Instead, look for exercises that will provide a high enough intensity to get your heart rate to reach MHR. Remember, this is the whole purpose of an HIIT workout, so if it's not happening, you're not really doing HIIT. Bodyweight lunges are not intensive unless you are in particularly bad shape. So instead, try high knees, tuck jumps and kettlebell swings. Remember that you can also increase your challenge by performing concurrent training. Kettlebell swings provide a great example of this, but so too can various other challenges like weighted pull-ups or muscle-ups. On the other end of the spectrum are those routines that are too challenging. While you might not like the idea of backing down from a workout, it's important to recognize that some routines are simply an invitation for injury. Chief amongst these are any routines that involve exhausting your cardiovascular system and then switching immediately to compound lifts with heavy weights. Do not exhaust yourself and then perform the muscle-up. The same goes for squats or deadlifts. These movements should go at the start of the circuit if you choose to include them, and you should use a light-ish weight to avoid injury. The tireder you get, the more your form will suffer. That doesn't matter for an inclined press or a jumping jack, but it really does matter for a deadlift. Another tip is to build the active recovery into your routine. If you can get your heart rate up to 95% MHR, then you can build in a small amount of active recovery at the next 30 second station. For example, you can perform tuck jumps followed by plank or muscle ups followed by light skipping. There will always be a station of actual recovery too though. Finally, Use other tricks to increase the calorie burn in a short space of time. If you switch from your legs to your upper body, for example, your heart will work harder in order to direct blood from the top to the bottom, as we discussed earlier. Likewise, you can design your circuit with different lengths at each station in order to mimic something akin to cardio acceleration. Or why not use a long session of intense cardio right at the start of your circuit to increase your heart rate and reduce your glycogen stores? You can also add your own finisher at the end of your routines. The best type of circuit routine if you aim to burn fat and build muscle will be one that uses every muscle in the body. A whole body routine will not only provide the most even improvements throughout your physique, but will also help you to trigger the biggest release of growth hormone, testosterone and other anabolic hormones. Want to build more size and less definition with your Metcon circuits? Then a good option is to use the same type of routine, but to focus more on one muscle group. For example, you might perform only bicep exercises as your main form of resistance training and schedule CV stations in between, essentially making a structured form of cardio acceleration. This will allow you to focus on one muscle group enough to cause real damage and metabolic stress. By continuously returning to the same muscle group, 
you'll be able to cause more micro-tears, which will contribute to more repair and more growth stroke strength. Likewise, you'll be able to flood that one muscle group with more blood and more hormones, which will make it more likely to grow in a very big way. This now becomes something more akin to a bodybuilding workout, but with the added cardio in order to provide the benefits of HIIT. If you don't have time to focus each session on a different muscle group, then consider using a push-pull routine instead and switching between pushing movements and pulling movements to train the muscles. Hopefully, this video series has opened your eyes to the world of HIIT and just what a powerful training tool this really is. Moreover, I hope you have discovered some new forms of HIIT and training that you might not have heard of before. And maybe you've learned there's nothing wrong with creating your own protocols which are better suited to your goals. You know the science, so why not combine fartlek, cardio acceleration and metcon into one brutal routine? You know, get inventive. But before we go, though, Make sure you recognize the importance of combining your HII2 routines with the right lifestyle. If you want to maximize your fat loss and muscle building, then you should look at supplementing with extras like creatine and possibly a protein shake. Losing weight also means eating a healthy diet that maintains a calorie deficit, and if you want to avoid burning out, you need to make sure you're getting plenty of rest and lots of sleep. And don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. HIIT is amazing, no doubt, but it's also only one piece of the puzzle. Steady state cardio still has its advantages and is excellent for improving your resting heart rate, for example. Likewise, you can use regular weight training in order to build muscle much quicker. Instead of falling in love with each new training method and forgetting the old routines, instead, Look at how you can combine new information with what you already know to create something even more effective. How about using a Tabata routine at the end of your workouts as a finisher and throwing in some steady state cardio into your routine as well? Experiment and find what works for you. But the very last thing I want to leave you with is that you must make sure your routine is sustainable. Ask yourself honestly if the routine you've devised is something you can stick at indefinitely. Remember, although HIIT is all about fits and starts, general health is a marathon, not a sprint. And I wish you everything.